ever since the day, ever since the day the Lord Jesus, ever since the day Jesus came away, filled me with the song and I'll never be alone, ever since the day, ever since the day the Lord Jesus, ever since the day Jesus came away, Filled me with the song and I'll never be alone. Walking in darkness, alone in the night. He flooded my soul with his heavenly light. He turned me around, yes, he changed my ways. I'm gonna keep singing till the end of my days. Ever since the day, ever since the day the Lord Jesus. Ever since the day Jesus came away. Fill me with the song and I'll never be alone. I don't have to fret about what tomorrow will hold. I'm living each day with His love in my soul. Though trouble and heartache will still come my way. I'm gonna keep singing till the end of my days. He brought the sunshine into my life. He gave me a peace that I never knew before. He brought a dead man back to life. I'm gonna keep singing His praise forevermore, forevermore, ever since the day, ever since the day the Lord Jesus, ever since the day Jesus came away, filled me with the song and I'll never be alone, ever since the day, ever since the day the Lord Jesus. Ever since the day Jesus came away, filled me with the song and I'll never be alone. Ever since the day, yes, ever since the day the Lord Jesus. Ever since the day Jesus came away, filled me with the song and I'll never be alone. Wow, I hope that song really pumped you up some like it pumps me up. I'm 66 years old now and started singing that song when I was 28 or 29 years old. And man, it's just as exciting to me now as it ever was. The song says I'm going to keep on singing all the end, until the end of my days. And, and folks, I've done that. My wife and I, Wanda, uh, sang that when we first met. Even before we were married, she'd play the piano. Sometimes I'd play the guitar. We didn't have soundtracks, so we'd go and do school chapel programs and youth occasions, things like that. We always sang that song. And I'm so grateful now at 66 years of age, it excites me just as much. Matter of fact, that was one of the first contemporary Christian music songs that got that title written by Tim Shepard, and Tim's still around. But he and Dallas Holm and uh, Amy Grant, even then uh, Russ Taff, uh, some of those, B.J. Thomas was considered contemporary Christian music at the time. And I, I want to tell you, those were exciting days. I told my wife recently, I said, Wanda, you and I were contemporary before contemporary was cool, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, your styles change through the years, but I love that song. What a joy to be able to sing it again. I want to welcome you to this broadcast of a fresh start. At some time we all need a fresh start. When I think back now at 66 years of age and singing that song back in 1980 and before that and what my life has been like since then, I gotta be honest with you. I've had to make some a fresh starts in my life. Never done anything immoral along those lines, but just times in life you just feel like, Lord, I, have I missed your direction here? And and you know, just really starting fresh at different times in life. And I'm so thankful that's who we represent as Christians, the Lord who loves us that much. Hey, I've got something exciting I want to share with you tonight. This book, Divine Disciplines, is one that I've written that has been published within this past year. And you'll see some information on the screen about through, you can order it through Barnes and Noble or through Amazon. Now, I've tried to get some uh, uh, bookstores to publish it and all, and 
It's, it's hard, hard to get that done today. My previous book, Channel of Blessing, when I wrote that in uh, 2002, it was carried by Lifeway and Cedar Springs, all the bookstores in the Knoxville area and Memphis area. But if you'd like it to be in a bookstore, what I would ask you to do is contact that bookstore and ask them to contact Enovo Publishing Company. And uh, Enovo Publishing Company, who published uh, this book, Divine Disciplines, will help you with the ordering. I don't have anything to do with uh, selling the book other than I have a few copies with me sometimes and do that. But it's uh, available, of course, through Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I can also tell you this, if you forget the link on the screen or whatever, all you have to do, if you, you're on the Internet, is just type in uh, Dr. Bobby Mullins, Divine Disciplines, Amazon or type it Barnes & Noble that way, and the link will come up then for how you can order the book. I, I just want to read some off the book, and I'm going to talk overall about divine disciplines and the Scripture passage here on the program tonight. But uh, I want to share with you what this book is all about and why I wrote it. On the back cover of the book, it says, Adversity is essential for every Christian. There's no development of Christ-likeness in a person's life apart from some degree of suffering and brokenness. Difficulties are necessary occurrences in the growth and development of our Christian lives. Christians are not exempt from experiencing trials and problems and suffering. God not only allows adversity, but He even brings it upon us at times. He does not do so because we lack faith, or because of our spiritual disobedience, but the Lord uses adversity to increase our faith. It is God's training ground for spiritual growth and maturity, and that's the subtitle of Divine Disciplines. It further states, Divine Disciplines examines the how and why of God's discipline. Among the disciplines covered in the book are darkness, delay, differences, difficulty, disappointment, disturbance and drudgery. This book by no means exhausts the various ways by which God disciplines us, but it will be an encouragement and an enlightenment to you as you see some of the experiences of your life through divine disciplines. I want to tell you for me personally, there were times in my life I would think, Lord, Lord, why am I being punished for this? You know, it just didn't seem like something was going right, and it wasn't that God was punishing me wasn't that I was out of His will. God was training me. He was helping me to grow in my faith. And the first chapter of the book deals with the overall purpose of divine discipline, that it is for our best. And in a moment, I'll read verses 4 through 11 of Hebrews, where the whole theme comes out about divine disciplines comes out. But I do want to read a little bit of the first chapter. Before discipline you because of misbehavior, Perhaps one of your parents actually expressed to you the well-known cliché, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. But of course you never believed it then. And as a father who has felt it necessary at times to discipline my children, I do understand the intent of that much-used statement. The emotional hurt I felt was not as physically painful as that of my children. But I hurt too, especially when my children got so repentant. Why did I discipline my children for misbehavior if it hurt me as well as them? Well, it is biblical. God tells us in His Word that it is necessary to properly train His children. I also disciplined my children because I believed it was for their good. It certainly was not pleasurable, but the Bible teaches that it is best when our children receive correction for improper displays of behavior. I also disciplined my children in positive ways as they grew older. It was not because of something they did wrong, but it was to teach and train them in what is necessary to exist in life. For instance, we discipline our children to learn how to dress themselves, to feed themselves, to read and write, to carry on a proper conversation, to develop balanced work and play habits, and to get proper rest. God disciplines His children in like manner. Actually, we discipline our children 
in the manner or means by which God disciplines us. We'll read Hebrews 12:10 in just a moment, but here in the first chapter of divine disciplines, I say that Hebrews 12:10 emphasizes that as earthly fathers discipline their children as seems best to them, God disciplines us for our best. The discipline of God is for our best because it is to our advantage and to our profit. And one of the reasons it's for our best is to help us to conform to God's will, to confirm us as His children, to correct us where needed, and to rest us. So that's the beginning chapter there of the book, Divine Disciplines. Now, it's in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews where we see this overall theme of God's discipline upon us. Beginning with verse 4, Chapter 12 of Hebrews, the Bible says, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now the word there, chastening, can also mean correcting, I like to think of it uh, as the term discipline, but not discipline necessary because you've done something wrong, but again, as I mentioned, to help you develop uh, into the right person that you ought to be. So if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. What son is he whom the Lord chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, you're not truly a son. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chase enough after their own pleasure, but for our profit, divine discipline, God's divine disciplines is for our profit, for our best, and for our profit that we might be partakers of His holiness, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised by it. Now, I just want to kind of give you an overview here tonight, not preach expositorily through this passage. If you get the book in the first chapter, I do deal with those verses, verse by verse expositorily, why God's divine discipline is for our best. But also, as I began to read my utmost force highest with Oswald Chambers, I would see kind of these themes come out about divine darkness, divine delay, and so on. I heard a great sermon years ago by an evangelist in 1986, and he preached on divine disciplines, and he shared some of these terms. And then I began to study it then, and God helped me to develop Uh, this into a book. Matter of fact, when I graduated from seminary as a 39-year-old married man with three children in uh, 1990, I was so relieved. You would have thought I wouldn't have done anything, but I started writing Divine Disciplines. I'd wanted to do it since 1986, and I I still have the original. I love this book here. You'd you'd rather read this, but I still have my original handwritten uh, copy of manuscript of divine disciplines it's been developed more since then but i finished it in 1990 one day in my office at my church when i was minister of singles and i taught it in a church training class when um, i became a pastor i preached through it rewrote it let it sit dormant for several years then uh, i left the ministry for a while to start a fresh start and back to the basics ministry so i rewrote it then and let it lie dormant again for a while. And then I saw where there was a publishing company that would allow you to submit manuscripts online. And I did it. And, and they offered to publish the book and took about a year. But last November, it was released. But I want to share with you about each of the divine disciplines that it shares in there and, and who uh, I, I see in the Bible as an example of that particular divine discipline. Now, let me tell you something. I deal with seven in the book. 
There are more. It doesn't exhaust it. It's just to give an example. But I really believe in my life, I've experienced at some time, I've been a Christian since I was 10, 66 now, but I believe at some time in my life I've developed or I've lived through every divine discipline that I share. Now the first one, which I'll share with you in just a moment, is the toughest of them, and I gave four chapters to it. But anyway, we talked about the purpose of divine discipline as seen in the 12th chapter of Hebrews is that God's doing it for our best, for our prop, profit, that it shows that we're His children and He's doing it that uh, we might have the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our life. Now, I shared seven different divine disciplines. The divine discipline of darkness, the divine discipline of delay, of differences, the divine difference of difficulty, of uh, disturbance, and then divine drudgery. And um, I may have left one out there, but we'll get to it at another time. But what I want you to see with God's divine disciplines is uh, how things happen in life for us as Christians. And there are some times it's not because we've done anything wrong. But I believe it's to keep balance in life. You know, if for us, everything was always going our way, what happens? We get pretty confident then we don't spend the time in prayer that we should. And I find sometimes when things do go my way, it's when God allows adversity to come, then that gets me back right in my prayer life and spending time with the Lord. But the divine disciplines that we have covered here in this book First of all, divine darkness. Now, I want to tell you something. Divine darkness is the toughest of all the divine disciplines to endure. It's when you go through a period in your life where you know God is there, but you don't seem to be like you're getting through with God. He's there. Now, one of the best examples of divine darkness and several times in the book that is named after Job, he talked about that he was in a period, or he referred to what was happening in his life as darkness. I mean, you know, God took everything away from him except his life and his wife. Later, God gave it all back to him. But he went through a period where he, he just, Lord, what have I done? What's going on? Do you know something Everybody thinks it was Satan who was the one who caused Job to have so much trouble. Well, he did in a way. But Satan didn't come to God and say, Lord, God, uh, God, I want to, you, you let me have Job and I want to make his life miserable. God pointed out to Satan the kind of man that Job was. He said, he's the most upright man in all the earth. There's nobody else like him. That's when Job then said, let me have him for a while and we'll see. But Job went through divine darkness. One of the things that divine darkness uh, trains us to do is to hear God, to seek God's voice above all others, to stay upon God until you hear His voice and then speak God's message in the light. God sometimes has to remove all the distractions in our life and when we're in divine darkness, you're so desperate to hear from God. And when you do, God wants you to speak that message in the light. A couple of other examples of divine darkness are Abraham. He uh, decided to take things into his own hand when God said he was going to have his own son to uh, bear his name and his inheritance, and he went about it the wrong way. And so he got into a period of divine darkness it also teaches us to heed God. We need to wait for the Father. We need to walk by faith. And they said Abraham was a man of faith. Another example of divine darkness is David. David says several times in the Psalms and in the other books in the Bible that tell about David, he refers to times in his life as a time of darkness, not physical darkness, but spiritual darkness. So divine darkness, God sends it in our life to train us to hear God, to teach us to heed God, that we'll turn all our hope upon God. I also don't have time to go into it tonight, but Isaiah 45 verses 2 and 3 talk about the treasures of darkness. And it talked about literal 
treasures that were stored away at that time. But I also believe there's a spiritual truth in that God allows darkness in our life and we discover the, tre the treasures of darkness, <clears throat> that we have God's presence, that we have His power to lead us to pray, to have perfect peace. There's a, another divine discipline, divine delay. I use Moses as the example of divine delay because you know what happened to Moses? He knew that he was to be the deliverer of his people. But he wasn't quite ready to lead them yet. You know what had to happen? God had to get the Egypt out of Moses so Moses could get the Israelites out of Egypt. And God sent him to the backside of the desert for 40 years. Divine delay. 40 years earlier, Moses knew that God was going to use him in a special way to be the deliverer of his people. But he wasn't ready for it yet. And so see, in divine delay, it's God allows that to help us get in stride with God, to develop our character for God. And it also, then we can see our true commitment to God and grow in our faith. Oh, here's another one that's hard for Christians. You know, divine delay is tough enough. You want to do something, you know God's going to do it, and you have to be patient and wait for Him to do it. But He does it in time. Sometimes that divine delay can be for years, sometimes... It's not. I waited from 1990 till 2017. I believe I knew God wanted me to write a book called Divine Disciplines. It would be published, but it took 36 years, you know, or 26 years, 27 to get that book done. Divine delay. Divine differences. You see that in John chapter 21 where Peter and John are there and the Lord has forgiven Peter and uh, then Peter says, well, how uh, the Lord lets uh, Peter know he's going to die by crucifixion. Matter of fact, Peter didn't, want, didn't feel worthy to die the same way as Jesus, so he was crucified upside down later. But he said, well, what's going to happen to John? And Jesus said, that's not, what is that to you? Sometimes you have divine differences. Peter died a martyr. John did live to old age and gave us the book, you know, wrote the book of Revelation. And we see other examples of that. One of my favorite of all the Bible personalities is Caleb. Caleb was the early spokesman when the spies went out to the land of Canaan, the, the promised land, and came back, and the people wanted to say, we can't go in because 10 of the 12 spies, only Caleb and Joshua said, we can go in and have victory, but the others didn't. And so they wanted to stone Caleb and Joseph, uh, Caleb and Joshua, and also they wanted to stone uh, Moses and Aaron to death. But Caleb was the spokesman. He said, with us, God, we've got a majority. He was the spokesman more often than not. But when it came time to succeed Moses, he chose Joshua. I think Caleb could have been the president. That's divine differences. He could have been the president of Israel. And then there's divine difficulty. Man alive, folks. You know, all of us in life are going to experience difficulty at some times. Seems like we're going from one difficulty to the next. That's just the way life is. Well, an example of divine difficulty in the Bible is Paul. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet we don't get discouraged, perplexed, but not in despair. Sometimes persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. And God allows divine difficulty that the power of Christ may stay upon us. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He asked the Lord to remove. The Lord didn't. That kept him submissive. That kept him in the kind of relationship with the Lord to help him through in all ways that the power of Christ may stay upon him, that the presence of Christ may be strong, that the person of Christ can be seen in us. There's also divine disappointment which uh, God sends into our life. And Paul's another example of that. I'm going to speak on this one on an upcoming uh, a fresh start. But there were two names that Paul mentioned in the Bible about people who were disappointments to him. You ever been disappointed in somebody? At that point in his life, we use 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul said, All forsook me but the Lord. 
Well, they really hadn't. Some of his friends weren't able to be there. But he felt like, he ever felt like, everybody has forsaken me but the Lord. Another divine discipline is divine disturbance. I don't really use one example in the Bible there, but God sent divine disturbance to the early church because in Acts 1.8 He said, Take the gospel to Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, to all the world. And they were having such a wonderful time in Jerusalem that they weren't getting beyond that. So in Acts 1 it said He caused a disturbance. They put James to death and they all scattered for their lives, but they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus. So divine disturbance can come into our life. Then divine drudgery. This is one of the most interesting of all. But I use Jesus as an example there. What, what, what do we know about His life from the time He was 12 till He was 30? They talked about at the age of 12 He was uh, fascinating the teachers of the law and so on in Jerusalem. He had 18 years where well, we don't know anything about the life of Jesus. He probably became a carpenter like Joseph, his earthly father. He developed other things in his life, but it... We don't have any recording of any miracles or things that he did there. He did a routine over and over again like many of us have to do in life, and that's divine drudgery. Well, folks, that's just an introduction tonight to divine disciplines, God's training ground for spiritual growth and maturity. Again, there on the screen, you'll see how you can order the book through Amazon or through Barnes & Noble. I believe this book will be a help to you and pray that you'll use it. I also pray that uh, if you're not saved, you're not sure you're saved, that you'll confess your sins as the Bible says, repent of your sins, turn from your sins, ask Christ into your heart. Perhaps you've been wanting to do that for a while. And just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I want to turn from my sins. I want to trust you to be my Lord and Savior. And then, friends, turn around and live the rest of your life for the Lord. There's a way that I'll close this program out most every time. And I want you to be able to say with me, Thanks be to you, O God, who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.